When measuring concentrations, do you ever stop and think about what goes on the scenes behind a nanodrop? It's really cool. A nanodrop is a type of spectrophotometer. Scary word basically shines light and it measures how much of that light is stolen. And we can use a spectrophotometer to measure how much light is stolen in a solution that's full of proteins or DNA or RNA to figure out how much of that protein or DNA or RNA was in the mixture. We can do this because as I talk about in other posts, Biological molecules absorb different wavelengths of light more strongly. They each absorb a kind of spectrum where they absorb different wavelengths to different amounts. They have these characteristic spectrums. And there'll be one place where they absorb the most. And we can use this place based um, to figure out the concentration of the solution because how much light is absorbed is going to depend on a few things. It's going to depend on how much each of the, each copy of that thing absorbs light. It's going to depend on how many copies there are and it's going to depend on how many copies the light interacts with it runs into on its way through your solution. And so these are taken into account with this thing called Beer's Law. Um, where basically you have the extinction coefficient takes into account how much each copy of the molecule absorbs light at a specific wavelength. Then you have the number of copies in per volume. So you basically you have the concentration, the C. And then you have to take into account the path length. And so in a traditional um, spectrophotometer, you're using something like a cuvette, where basically you make this column of liquid and then the light is going to shine through this column. Well, you don't make a column, you just fill your tube up with liquid. And you need a lot of liquid, typically. And so, but your sample, you often dilute it in here because what's going to happen is that the absorbance, basically, so we talked about how it's going to depend on your path length, it's going to depend on your extinction coefficient and it's going to depend on how many molecules are in there. So the more molecules are in there stealing that light, the higher the absorbance is going to get. And if you have a fixed wave, a fixed path length like one of these, then what's going to happen is it's going to oversaturate the detector and you're not going to be able to get an accurate reading. In a nanodrop, however, what it does is it actually changes its column length automatically in order to adjust for the concentration of your sample. So we can take a wide range of samples and you don't have to actually um, like dilute your sample. And so it's really awesome. But where is the column in a nanodrop? How a nanodrop actually works is you stick a little drop of liquid of containing your molecules of interest onto the pedestal and then you take that pedestal, you take the top part of it, the metal part, and you bring it down. And what's going to happen is that then it kind of pulls up a little and makes a little path like the little column of water. And it's able to do this because water is really sticky, both for itself and for surfaces. And so you get adhesion where it basically sticks to the surface, those metal like parts on the top and the bottom, and then it sticks to itself. So you have adhesion where the water molecules are sticking to other water molecules. And so when it's stuck to the bottom and it's stuck to the top and it pulls up a little, you get this column. And so you get this column and then the light shines through the top. So instead of shining like through the side, like in a cuvette, it's actually going to shine down from the top. And then you have your detector below that's going to measure how much of that light is stolen. And so the nano drop, you have this variable path length, which can make things really complicated if you were to go and try to calculate the concentration based on Beer's law. But the ni another nice thing about the nanodrop is it actually converts the, like the path length, it, so it shows you the absorbance as if the path length were um, one centimeter, which is the typical length. So one centimeter is the same as 10 millimeters, so you might see it written both ways. The nanodrop, even though the actual path length is going to be smaller, it's going to adjust that. And so it will um, just read out as if it was, you took the reading from a normal like cuvette spectrum spectrophotometer. Um, but so with the nanodrop, it's really great that you're using really tiny volumes. And so somewhere between one and two microliters. But it also can be a little less accurate. Um, so there are more accurate methods you could use even with a tiny little sample such as a qubit um, that uses like fluorescent molecules that bind um, to DNA or RNA or protein. Um, there's different kits for different ones. Um, but for the nanodrop, it's really great that you only need a tiny bit of sample. Um, but be wary that they, it's not the most accurate, especially if you're at low concentrations. So don't trust like, especially like the ratios of 260 to 280 and that sort of thing, if you're at really low concentrations. Once you concentrate your sample a little, that'll become more accurate. So I'm talking about like 260 to 280 and this sort of thing. Basically you can absorb you, molecules because they absorb wavelength at different light 
they absorb light at different wavelengths and because different molecules have different characteristic spectrum you can kind of measure things like the 260 versus the 280 to figure out if you have protein contaminating your DNA sample so proteins can absorb more strongly at 280 whereas the DNA and the RNA are going to be less strong there so you can get these ratios of things where you kind of get more information about the purity as well as getting information about the concentration where you're using that fixed wavelength and so much more on this in other posts that I will link to. But today I just wanted to call you, tell you about the coolness that goes on in the nano drop. And so you have that drop, you put it down, you pull, it pulls up, and it pulls up to the right length so that it doesn't saturate the receptor. It, has a, it, it figures out the right path length, but then it converts it in its software and stuff so that you see the path length as if it were just taken from a normal cuvette. What can happen though is that that column might not form very well. Um, this can happen if you don't have enough liquid or if your liquid has a lot of things that act, are acting as surfactants or surface acting agents. So these would be things like detergents that basically they're going to interrupt all those water-water interactions that you need in order to make that column. And so if you're interrupt interrupting those it's going to be harder to make the column also if you have like a bunch of protein and things in there it's going to kind of make it harder too because you're breaking up the water molecules and interactions one way that you can with the protein um, is to like pipette more and so typically for a pro you're using one to two microliters typically for a nano drop I would um, with protein I always do like if I can I do Try, try to do like one and a half to two microliters, a little more than I would use. I, with the DNA or RNA, I would do a lower um, amount. You have less of the problem with it, like breaking up the water. Um, so you get a better column, but with the protein, it can be it can be harder to form that column. Also be careful when you're putting the drop on that you don't, that it actually goes onto the pedestal on the, like the, the hole where the light's going through and detecting. And so I always like check after I pipette it on that there's no bubbles and that it's right over the sensor. So sometimes when you're pipetting, you can kind of like accidentally push it off. Make sure it's, the drop is right on top of the hole. Um, and yeah, and be sure to blink it. So do a sample without your solution, but with all the background stuff, your buffer and everything beforehand. Um, you also have to like, when you're done, you wanna wipe down the um, wipe down the thing so you don't leave on crusty gunk for the next person who then think that their sample is contaminated when really it was contaminated with, with your sample, but the actual tube of it wasn't fine or the concentration was off or that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so that's the basics of an anodrop and it's really, really handy. And I will link to the post on how you can actually calculate the concentration based on the extinction coefficient or they have like built in the like standard extinction coefficients for like the average molecules but it's going to depend on things like especially for proteins the size of your protein the number of the different amino acids um, which of those because only some of the amino acids are absorbing the UV light strongly so how many of those have it's going to depend Expasy prop program is your friend for that and so I will post links to those various things and hope this helped tell you about how an anodrop worked and how cool it is